Well, thank you, Doug, and I'm really grateful for your leadership and being the catalyst for all of this. Uh, I want to say in, in um, the context of bringing uh, Tom Tomich up here that we're together today to see how uh, we can engage students, faculty, staff with the community in solving two pressing problems that are in front, in front of us. And one is exemplified by the map up there, the USDA map of uh, uh, food deserts, that we have problems right here in our own communities in terms of uh, not just uh, outright hunger, but food security, obesity, diabetes, that our university resources uh, should um, find ways to um, impact in a more comprehensive way, and that's why uh, Doug and Melanie and, and Chris and, and uh, Rafael and Sally and I uh, felt it was so important to join forces, not just all of us from different colleges, but with all of you as well. But the second part, I think, also exemplifies what uh, Tom and Gail are doing at Davis, and that's that they're linking this... Um, uh, some very tangible local actions that the University of California is involved in with understanding how our global food system works and in their case how California impacts that and vice versa how California's food security and environmental health in uh, rural and urban communities is impacted by that globalized thing. So the, the remarkable thing about Tom Tomich to me is that he has just this brilliant, brilliant uh, career in international uh, uh, community development. And he's brought what he's gleaned from working in countries from Egypt to Indonesia, home to where he was born on a farm in California, and has just done amazing things since he's come back to his home ground that I think is, is very touching to me to see, to imagine all of us having an impact um, back uh, in the very community where our, our uh, parents and, and uh, uh, neighbors are really now engaged in some of the things um, that, that we find important. Um, I first met Tom through the uh, Kellogg uh, Sustainable Food Systems Program. We both have in Dow Chairs, but he's also helped coordinate this whole network of scholars in a dozen or so universities across the country that are trying to use Kellogg endowments to jumpstart a variety of activities, not only on their campuses, but in their communities. He's a, a director of the new uh, Ag Sustainability Institute at Davis, but that's emerged out of activities that he and Gail and many others have been involved in. And where, where last week uh, they took me around to see this marvelous uh, Russell Ranch that's sort of a model of a long-term field station um, uh, dedicated to sustainability uh, studies, not, with not just with agricultural crops, but ecological restoration, pollinators, uh, water and soil conservation. Um, it, he, they put together the pieces that they've had on their campus in a way that's made a cohesive whole, and I think that's the wisdom that he and Gail um, uh, have to bring us uh, today uh, that that obviously there's been great work done in this community and on campus and many of the topics we'll be talking about we're not starting from scratch but what they've really worked hard to do is how to bring that systematically together so that students from their first year on in college can work at the student uh, uh, farm that's on campus or at Russell Ranch a few miles away in ways where they tangibly jump into the dance their very first year in college and stay long-term players. And, and I want to tell you one touching story about when I visited them when they hosted the Kellogg meetings, uh, what was that, four years ago now? Probably. Maybe, yes. Yeah. Um, we went to uh, um, an inner city school in Sacramento that, that um, has an incredible food program that includes a, um, uh, an on-campus kitchen where kids are taught nutrition and health and all of that, but it's related to not just uh, uh, student gardens on the uh, school campus and uh, some micro enterprises where they're making salsa after school, marketing, doing dis business plans, doing recipes and all of that. A marvelous program that in part uses 
the produce from their own campus and from surrounding farms. But there's also an elder's garden for the ethnic uh, mix of parents and grandparents who saw what the kids are doing and wanted their own garden plots on the school grounds. Why I'm telling you this story is that uh, among the high school teachers there were UC Davis graduates that got on fire so much about what was happening there that they, when they got their degrees, they actually went back to the inner city high school that they had graduated and said, I want to use what I've learned to make change in my very own community. So that's the kind of spirit that, that Tom and you'll hear Gail at lunch have instilled in this comprehensive program at Davis that's a model. They're also involved in, I think, something that we should look at that's also happening in New England at another level where um, uh, Tom directs a whole UC system-wide exchange among the universities on sustainable agriculture research and education. In the New England, it's called uh, Sustainable Food Solutions or New England Food Solutions. And President Hart was uh, fundamental in helping bring that uh, network together. So this is about, I think what we can learn from Tom is how we interact not only on campus but with the many community partners and I just have to say we're starting off this conference with the best possible uh, uh, catalyst for positive change in the country, Tom Tomich. Oh, wow. so, so between Gary's wonderful introduction Andrew Comrie's opening re remarks, there's really not very much left for me to say. <laughs> I, I do want to say, I feel a bit, bit humble coming here, more than a bit humble, um, because much of what I'm going to be talking about was actually done over, truth be told, decades before I was hired seven years ago. So I, I, Doug, I think you've heard me say, I, I just showed up for the easy part of implementing a, a building on a foundation that had been laid for quite a while. And I think maybe the, one of the key tasks, and probably you've already done it, is what are the foundations you've already got here to build on? And uh, my goodness, uh, we had a wonderful set of visits yesterday, thanks to Raphael and Doug, that um, with public schools, with the uh, food bank, with public places here in Tucson, that in one sense were completely novel to me, and in another sense was like, this is exact, I see, exactly see the connections. So it's, I think it's very good for those of us who are doing this kind of, let's face it, there's a certain amount of organizational drudgery to this, to actually step out of where we were, go see other exciting things. I found it very invigorating, energizing, and inspiring, and it will be great to go back with some renewed optimism. And, and that same vein, it was wonderful to have Gary visit us last week. And Gary, every day I'm getting emails from colleagues and students saying how much they enjoyed having you visit. So I, I think there is an important California-Arizona nexus. I'm big on competition too as an economist. <laughs> and I think, I think the more we know about each other, the more constructive the competition can be. Uh, so so we, ought to, we ought to be doing some kind of annual exchange. So, you just see, you, you did a great job of, uh, do I have to, I can't use this one? No, but that's for the uh, ah. video. You have to use both, actually. I have to use both? <laughs> May I just use one? Yes. Okay, so this is the mic I should use to give the shout out to the Pima College students. Yeah. Yes, hello Pima College students. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, I hope to, to meet you and visit there someday. Um, it's not on? No, that one doesn't, that doesn't project. I have to use both, but I have to stay in a fixed point. And I have to use my right hand and my left hand. <laughs> and is this some kind of a game show that I've walked into? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. I think I can do this. Um, so, so I mentioned humility. There's a little bit of hubris here of this list of all this stuff, but it's, it's actually up there, not to put pressure on you, Andrew, <laughs> but before you have to leave, I wanted to mention that, that this connection of, so being the director of the new institute, 
being the director of a statewide program that is California-wide, UC-wide, state university-wide, community college-wide, having the endowed chair come in and then having this position being tied to a faculty position was, I just walked into this. You could put a number of other people's names above this, but these ingredients in terms of the kind of the authority and the position and the privilege to lead were created by, by people like our provost. And so it's great to see you here because there is an element that's make or break about senior campus leadership supporting these sorts of things. Um, so great, and your, your remarks that, like I say, you, you've really covered a lot of what I'm gonna say. So that means I can go through it very quickly. Um, whoops. I've already. That was quick. How does? How does? There we go. Okay. So so think of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute as as one case study you might consider for for insights. Not as a blueprint, and certainly not as a done deal. It's still very <clears throat> very much a work in progress. Um, this whole you'll see me using this linking knowledge with action. Um, that's, that's kind of my way of talking about things rather than using the word extension. But it's very similar to Andrew's comment about impact. Um, so I'm mean, talking about our programs in education, extension, and research. And on this, I just wanted to say something. It's great that so many people are so excited about food, food systems, and that's such an effective lens into bringing young people in particular into interest in agriculture and a whole new generation of talent. But there also is, I must say, a little bit of faddishness to this. And so for me, one of the kind of the institutional metrics uh, in terms of thinking of who our key partners are in this, in this important endeavor is the ability to actually advance knowledge rather than just repackaging things. The, the creation of educational programs that again are not just repackaging of our grandparents college education but actually are pedagogically innovative and finally this ability I've put extension in quotes but this ability to actually link that knowledge advancement with action to me I'm looking for partners that have those three kinds of capabilities okay um, and I'll talk a little bit about one case study, if I have time, uh, about where we are. And some of the, you'll see, I'll use the word legit legitimacy in a minute, and that may sound very abstract, but it turns out that creating legitimacy with our state and the whole range of people in our state is a key element for us to be able to do what needs to be done. And what needs to be done is bringing science to bear on things that are big issues that tend to be politicized and controversial. Okay. So why do you need the University of California if, can, if we can't deal with things like drought or nit nitrate contamination of groundwater or access to food? All of those big things all tend to be, they have political dimensions to them. And so part of what we're trying to do is to create an institution that has the foundations to be able to engage while retaining our scientific integrity. Okay. So one thing is every land-grant university in the United States is idiosyncratic. I think that was part of the brilliance of the Morrill Act was it said, here's some resources, go do something with it. Now who would say no to an offer like that? But it means that every one of us, so the University of California as a whole, the 10 campuses, in our case, is the land-grant institution. So I just want to say a little bit of a cautionary note that there's much of what we've been surfing is a set of idiosyncratic institutional histories that maybe have only limited relevance here in Arizona. Um, but in, in the case of, of the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, we're primarily associated with the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences at UC Davis. But because of that SARA statewide connection, we also have a mandate across the whole University of California system and across the whole state. So is my life complicated? Yes, but I knew that coming in. And these complications actually give us 
opportunities to do things that if, if we were to be able to fit neatly in an organizational chart, we wouldn't have as many opportunities. So that's my feeling. Okay. So one thing just to say, um, Gary already did a really good job of giving a bit of the institutional map. So if we were to do kind of a, um, an inventory of the assets that largely were already in existence when I came in, um, this is just a list. So the student farm at UC Davis was founded in 1977. Okay. The Russell Ranch Sustainable Agriculture Facility grew out of two programs that started in the mid to late 80s. The Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program was, say, founded in 1986. It was actually imposed on the University of California by the state legislature in 1986 over the objections of senior university administrators. So imagine the reception that early directors of SARAP faced with the administration of the University of California. Gail shaking her head said, yes, yeah, she knows a lot about this. As I said, I showed up for the easy part and have had the benefit of that uh, enthusiastic support. We do have this new interinstitutional network for food, agriculture, and sustainability that's endowed by the Kellogg Foundation. That is a network, and I'll, I'll be, uh, Gary mentioned it, it's, it's how we met. Um, it's very intentional on the part of the Kellogg Foundation to try to build a network that would leverage a lot of these efforts across the country. An important component of that, in my view, and one of the reasons why Gail and I are here, is to support, validate, legitimize efforts to do these kinds of innovative things within university settings that may seem a little bit wacky or a little bit out there. Well, exactly. That's where we need to be. But we need to support each other in doing that. We have an amazing external advisory board, basically who's who of the thought leaders in California, which turns out to be a tremendous advantage, especially when you go through a budgetary drought apart from the climatic drought that we've had. Um, we have a new undergraduate major, which has turned out to be, in many ways, the key integrative activity for our faculty. And that's, that's been a real revelation to me. We also support, um, so Andrew mentioned our, our graduate groups. We provide uh, support to some of those graduate groups, so master's and PhD level. Again, this is, this is back to the role of the provost. We had a cluster hire, eight FTE, eight lines that were put together by the then provost Hinshot Davis, university president threw in another position. We wouldn't have been able to get where we got to with this without this. It takes investment. Um, and there's also this issue of partnerships. Gail and I both spend a lot of our time thinking about connecting off campus, not just integrating across disciplines on campus. And those two planes of integration, so the interdisciplinary integration on campus and the connection between the university and society, those are the two big innovative but also integrative opportunities that we're really working hard to take advantage of. So this national network, um, you'll see University of Arizona is part of it. And you know, Gary, one thing we haven't talked about is how we might get more of your colleagues involved in that. Because um, it can't be just you and me carrying the whole load for that. But these, these are all uh, partners that have opted into this. Um, and it's, um, but think about the challenge. You all know Gary. Um, I'm very different in some ways, but very similar in the other that I take on way too much stuff. There's so much, I'm like a kid in the candy store, right? Can't say no to any exciting idea. Everybody who's involved in this essentially is afflicted with that, right? We have these wonderful jobs. So, Given people who are overcommitted locally and at the level of their state, what's the value proposition? What's on the offer that would cause them actually to just say something, say no to something really compelling, say right here in Tucson, and put some time and attention into a national effort? That's not a trivial question. We've been struggling with that. This is what that network is about. So you see food system resilience, you see illumination of critical trends. How do we know where we're actually going? Are we close to 
Utopia, are we close to driving off the cliff? We actually really don't know many aspects, but the part where we're, I think we're really getting traction as something valuable and additional is this effort to address inequity and vulnerability in the food system. That certainly resonates in California. I think it resonates here. You only have to add the terms environmental justice to that to say that this is, not, this is about what kind of communities we want to live in, but it's also about what kind of environment those communities need to be healthy. So this is, this is actually what we're working on now. We're using Kellogg money on a national network design process that's facilitated. And it just strikes me that some of those activities might actually produce insights that could be downscaled here. And we certainly plan to do that in California. So, you know, we throw around this word food system. Uh, there are different definitions. I think Gail's got a slightly different definition in her talk. I'm pragmatic about definitions. I don't think you should be slavish about them. But we tend to use this one from OECD for just to make the point People, people think about factories and they think about tractors and they think about grocery stores and that's the food system. And sure, there's an element of that, but I think the part that we don't really think about enough is the, is the human relations in the food system and how those are really choices that we make. Those are the results of choices made by many people and those are also shaped by policy. So much of what I'm going to say is, is actually about those human relationships. And then there's the, what does sustainability mean? Everybody knows this Brundtland one. I think everybody uses this. Um, meeting the needs of the present. Also that relationship to future generations. Now, this is actually a picture from my family farm in California. My daughter, who's much bigger now. Cameroon, Northern Thailand, places I've worked. You know, one of the questions is, is, is this sustainability, is there a general theory or a general practice of sustainability that spans those or is it completely idiosyncratic? If it were completely site-specific, idiosyncratic, it wouldn't be an appropriate thing for the University of California, University of Arizona to do. I mean, we're looking for those broad patterns. And that's another reason why this kind of, say, exchanging information between California and Arizona, which have comparable elements but different, oh, thank you, Gary, but also contrast that can help us to actually understand what is the scope of this great challenge of the 21st century. Now, one thing about this Brundtland report is suppose you're a farmer or suppose you're a community activist or suppose you run a Fortune 500 company. This actually doesn't give you very much guidance about what you'd actually do year to year, or day to day. How do, you, how do you convert this into action? Well, one of the things that we did in, we did a strategic plan too. We call it a strategic snapshot because we don't want it to be fossilized and we tend to change it all the time. But, whoops, wrong way. Um, one of the things we did was what, what would be the characteristics of a sustainable food system? We always underline profitable. I'm going to be giving a talk in Fresno. How many people here know where Fresno is or what? Yeah, Fresno. Okay. Um, next week on climate, water, and food supply. So I'll use this slide, and a number of the people on the audience will think sustainability, that's about putting us out of business. And I always emphasize, you know, if, if you all go out of business, if everybody goes out of business, that's not sustainable. But we do have a bit, there's a messaging problem there about the economic part of sustainability. The healthy food, we, we always lead with food because for in California, 96, 97% of the people actually are not directly involved in food production at all in agriculture. They're food consumers. So that's the entry point. The social justice part, environment, human health, those, those are all there. But I think part, maybe what might be a bit surprising is we also emphasize public awareness and understanding and public participation. The idea is we're not going to get the food system we need without an informed public pushing for policy change that will produce a sustainable food system. Ah, I can Maybe I should turn this over. There we go. So we have a mission statement. This is all embedded in the first part, but what we say we do is integrative research, education, communication, and early action on big issues. 
It's easy to say that. How do you do it? Probably many of you will recognize Stokes, this idea of pastures quadrant. So two by two, one filter is, does this advance understanding? And the other filter is, is this useful or not? So a lot of 20th century academic strategy was shaped by this notion that there's a fundamental disconnect between applied and practical research. And I'll just assert here that at least in the field of sustainability and food systems, the cutting edge of knowledge is actually advanced through being engaged with producing useful things. Okay. But most, most of the colleagues at University of California are over here in this box most of the time, but not always. Um, many of our graduates, actually, PhDs, go into the application of knowledge to say public policy and things like that, not necessarily advancing knowledge. But ASI exists, or our aspiration is to be this use-inspired basic research where everything we do, we should be able to answer affirmatively. We're advancing fundamental understanding, and we're also being useful or relevant, connected. Now, colleague Bill Clark, who Diana knows well, I miss, I miss those debates between you and Bill, Diana. But anyway, Bill and I and a number of other people kind of took this another step forward. Uh, well, we think forward. We took it another step. We got it published in PNAS. So I guess that's forward. Um, about thinking about knowledge and organizational design. And so this, this graph or this table is really about sources of knowledge versus uses of knowledge. And this is the linking knowledge with action part. And let me just run through this quickly. One of the features I would say is that much of what we do in sustainability doesn't come packaged neatly along the lines of the disciplines we know. Okay. So we're almost always working in this bringing together multiple communities of expertise. So that's the interdisciplinary integration I talked about. Now, in terms of use of that knowledge, the University of California motto is, let there be light. It's, it's very much of an enlightenment institution. So there's basically nobody, no intended user around that. It's about advancing knowledge. So the, the key element of that organizationally is scientific credibility. So that's all the peer review, promotion processes. It's the quality control that major research universities all have in place. So we, I'm not going to say much more about this part. Now, at Harvard, they call this salience. You'll see I call it, at Davis, we call it usefulness. Um, it's kind of the same idea. But this is, if, if you have a particular user in mind, so this is the use-driven basic research. So it's coupling the advancement of knowledge with a particular application. Having a connection to those users is a key part of the innovation process. That was actually the genius of the Morrill Act and the Hatch Act. And so as public land grant universities, we, I think this culture is still very strong. I think some of the, at least in the University of California, some of those connections have become a bit weakened, but we're restoring them. But where at least at Davis we haven't done very well is if we get into this third level, we're talking about multidisciplinary and multiple user groups, particularly multiple user groups who have different vested interests, who have different values, who, if you're talking about water in California, they spend a lot of time in litigation against each other. Okay, So if you're going to work on water in California, this is the box you're going to be working in. And so in addition to scientific credibility, usefulness, this whole question of legitimacy is more than just a buzzword. And I'll say a bit more about what we've done to try to achieve that. But we were doing this in comparative case studies internationally. But what I'm saying is that this applies with equal force. And in fact, our civil society organizations in California, all the litigation, all of the outspoken growers, all of the environmental advocates actually make me feel a lot more optimistic 
that we can make progress, then I felt in a Southeast Asian authoritarian setting where I worked for a while, where you don't get that process of co-creation of solutions. So we got to accept that turmoil and messiness as I think part of the co-creation of high stakes solutions. Let's get used to it and let's expect it and let's, let's gear up for that. So within our, and this material is available on the website, but one of the key things that we did was to set up operational principles of what the Agricultural Sustainability Institute would do. So this doesn't apply to the whole Davis campus, the whole University of California, the whole College of Agriculture. It's just about us as a negotiation support unit, that, that quadrant I just showed you, that have to do with our standards for science, how we try to be responsive to stakeholders' needs, and not just narrow vested interests, but also broader interest in society. Um, and that brings me to the legitimacy part, which is, you start saying words like transparency, accountability, governance, how the questions get framed, and open access to results that we've identified as key ingredients of a claim for legitimacy in what we do. Okay. So, let's go back a bit to our heritage. Um, this is a 1930s picture from our animal science department. So you've got faculty members, you've got a bunch of dairy farmers. There are a few women in the picture, you have to look very closely, very few women, um, but pretty much a homogeneous group. This is kind of the romantic notion about how extension happened. This is from an extension manual, I'm embarrassed to say from not that long ago. So this is the idea of technology transfer, that linear process where we work in our labs, occasionally we go talk to farmers, come back to the lab, create a solution, and then we go out and we tell our buddies how they can do better. That's kind of the notion. And, you know, I, there are many of our colleagues in California in, in cooperative extension who are so much more sophisticated. I'm doing them a disservice. And yet, when we try to simplify and we talk about strategy, it's shocking to me how often we revert to this linear transfer paradigm. It's, I think it's a bit of intellectual laziness on our part because we should know better. Keith Warner, who did his doctorate at UC Santa Cruz, um, well, this was published in 2007. It's a book called Agroecology in Action. Is that too loud? Oh, it's oh okay. Um, Agroecology in Action. Keith actually went around the state of California and mapped out the program the projects of our CERP program that Gail's been working in. And so they all look like this. This is actually very schematic. They're much more complicated network di diagrams now. But this doesn't look linear, right? This is, this is a network. Okay, so this, this is the kind of networking with growers in there and lots of different sources of information. Some of them scientific, some of them commercial, some of them actually explicitly political that all interact in terms of this solution shape. So we have to understand this just to go from credibility to useful. So suppose we want to go to legitimate. This is our stakeholder map. So we, we put this together and my advisor, external advisory board is designed to represent as many of these ellipses as possible. And what I do, and I'm in the process of redoing that, is I think, Who's the thought leader in California in, among students? We always involve students in our advisory boards and, and various kinds of um, our management structures as well. But who are the thought leaders? And what's their, what's their track record? Do they, are they able to interact respectfully with people they disagree with? Now, the students, that's easy. When you get around to some of these others, actually, it's. Fortunately, and this is part of the investment that I think various societies have made in building trust in civil society, that's a key ingredient to what we do. So our advisory board is a bunch of people that are drawn from this framework. And we think that's important for legitimacy. It's also important for framing priorities. We, have, we did this online prioritization. 650 thought leaders from California voted on single 
topics. And the top 10 list from that is pretty good. But when we showed it to the advisory board, they said, oh, there's a big thing missing here. And they didn't do the online consultation. They were thinking about the future and their experience. They said, you haven't paid any attention to farm workers and food system workers. You have to. So that didn't come through the formal process. It came from the advisory board structure. I want to say it was actually some of the agribusiness and finance interest on the board that pushed the hardest for the farm worker agenda. Okay. So I think I'll skip. I mean, people always want to know what we do. I mean, this is some of the agenda that's come out of this. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but it basically goes from advancing basic process knowledge on water, energy, soil, to um, educating the next generation of leaders. And I guess I, what I would say is we, we do work with commercial farmers, conventional farmers, and organic farmers. Gail is leading work on farm workers. Um, we work with small scale and ethnic farmers, and I think Gail will be talking about that a little bit. But we also work with some of the biggest food companies on the planet. Okay, so in our case, we've made an explicit decision. We're not judging whether people are sustainable or not. The metaphor is the door is open to anybody who wants to raise their awareness and improve their practice. Um, but they do have to buy into those principles which have to do with transparency, open access, which in fact that open access part turns out to be a very effective screen. Um, but I want to get to the, the education part. And how are we doing on time, Doug? Doing okay? I'm sure fine. We're fine? Yeah, I think actually we are doing fine. How are we doing on sound? In the back? Okay. How about at Pima College, how's the sound? Good. Okay. I know you're out there. Um, so on this, taking this linking knowledge with action in our educational programs, um, the student farm is this gem. It came out of the 1970s. A group of students went into the dean, Charlie Hess, and they were, this, remember, we're, there was a Vietnam War, there were protests, and they were ready to pound on the table, and they said, we, we want a place on campus for alternative agriculture. And Charlie said, let's do that. And I think they were totally flabbergasted by that, but that, that was the source of our student farm, because they expected a no. Charlie had the wisdom to say, gee, this is an important way of channeling energy and enthusiasm. So we have various components. I just want to say that the ecological garden and the school garden program, those were ideas that came out from our students decades ago. Much of the best stuff we have were student ideas from earlier generations of students. So now that leaders have come around to embracing all this institutionally, one of the things I talk with our students about is how do we avoid institutionalizing this process so much that there's no, I used the word wacky before, right, this term of art, that we've got to keep the space for the fringe experiments and the wacky stuff. Because back in the day, this stuff was viewed as totally fringe. Um, we, the student farm is the focal point for much of the experiential learning related to the new undergraduate major. It starts there. It's not limited by that. We actually require students to have 12 quarter units of internship. No more than half can be on campus. So they do quite a bit at the student farm, but then they, they work on other farms. They work in the state legislature. They work for banks on agricultural finance. Um, but it's very important because, and it may be different here in Arizona, this is just casual empiricism, but I would say nine out of 10 of our students in the sustainable agriculture major come from one of the big urban centers on the coast. They're from San Diego, they're from LA, they're from San Francisco. They, they haven't been in a setting like this before. So this is, if you think about this sort of Sengian fringe experiments or the idea of creating safe spaces where people can be innovative and they can, they can do things that aren't too costly to do, but also the, the, the downside risks are buffered for them. That's what this place is about. Okay. So here's some pictures from the ecological garden. We have thousands of elementary school kids go there. We have a collaboration with UC Santa Cruz, which is about training of trainers for elementary school gardens, so creating the curriculum across the state. Because like a lot of places in the US, there's a whole lost generation in terms of food production. P 
parents and teachers, um, although there are some noteworthy exceptions, and I know you have some exceptional people here too in Tucson, but by and large, people really need support to be able to make these things happen. Um, and yes, our students do learn how to weld and drive tractors and things like that. Um, we're, we're kind of, we tend to overcompensate a bit. We're kind of touchy about the, in Fresno, they'll probably accuse me of coming from an ivory silo, which strikes a nerve, right? But it's this, we, we do this experiential learning stuff, and I think we do it quite well. We're very fortunate to have the space for that. Um, but I know you're interested in the badges, Diane. <laughs> That's because I was a girl scout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there is that part. In, in the, it, it, it's a kind of a mashup of scouting, girl scouting, um, some kind of credential programs that come out of the Silicon Valley. So if you're a high-level programmer of a particular uh, machine language, there are badges for that. And LinkedIn. How many here know what LinkedIn is? Okay, so if you're running an experiential based learning program where a lot of the valuable stuff doesn't go on the student's transcripts, how do they signal to potential employers about their skills? So that's what this badges program is about. Um, and the prototypes, it's kind of a rocky process. We've had support from the MacArthur Foundation and Mozilla Foundation to develop these and they're not quite ready for prime time. I did some experiments in my capstone course and it, it's, it takes quite a bit of effort to make something that students and faculty will contribute to. Um, but this is, again, open access. We would be, we don't own these badges. You folks could use badges. Now, this is what the different kinds of badges look like. When we started at we, before my time, my colleagues started to design the sustainable agriculture major. They, um, they did a, a Delphi study where they asked students, alumni, faculty and potential employers of our students, what, what are the skill and knowledge sets that you would like to see in students coming out of a sustainable agriculture and food systems major at UC Davis? I mean, these, these generate the very long lists, right? It's the skill, I think it's got welding on there and fence mending on skills and knowledge. It's soil science and it's, it goes through the whole list of what every discipline would say is absolutely indispensable, but th the list is impractical for any four-year program, any lifetime. So what my colleagues did was to say, well, let's develop a set of competencies or an understanding of competencies that, let's say, nobody can master all the skills, nobody can master all the knowledge, but what are some of the life competencies that really are essential in this educational program. So this is a pedagogical shift from a skill and fact-based curriculum toward embracing experience and structured around competencies. So systems thinking, the ability to use evidence in experimentation and inquiry, communication, grappling with values, Remember that Brentland definition, it's about future generations. You start talking about alternative paths. This is hard for me as an economist, because we're trained. Don't dispute about values, right? Just take values as given. But if you're gonna talk about alternative futures, you can't duck the values thing. Civic engagement, personal development, strategic management, that's the linking knowledge with action part. So there are badges for all these things. Our curriculum for the major is developed around these competencies. I do a capstone course which sort of tries to take it to the next level, which is about expression of these competencies in multidisciplinary teams, which is actually the antidote to the, since none of us can have all the skills and knowledge to be able to be the one person Rambo of food system sustainability, the key recommend, uh, recognition is you've gotta be able to identify people with complementary skill sets and complementary knowledge you've got to be able to respect them even if they're coming at it from a different kind of a discipline. And this is it's where some of the epistemology comes. I'll use that word too since you introduced it, Andrew. Epistemology comes in, respect for different ways of knowing comes in to search for solutions. Um, so what happened? So the students think this is great, the undergraduates. And then the graduate students and the postdocs start saying, whoa, we want this too. And then, you know, inevitably at the faculty meeting it was like, my gosh, we don't have these skills and competencies either. 
No, no, but that's a really good thing because it shifts everything around so that we're actually all trying to learn on, on good days. We're all trying to develop our competencies together. Okay? That reframes the educational process fundamentally. I'm giving you the, the official version of this, right? It, day to day, it's much messier, as I said. I warned you about the messiness. So here's what this, the list of knowledge looks like. Um, systems thinking is one of the, the key ones, I think. That, that I think we do fairly well on the systems thinking in our, in our curriculum. Um, that seems to be an easier one. Uh, I mentioned how I'm personally threatened by being taking seriously the different values. Uh, that's, but it's something, see, we all got to be tested a bit in this. Um, the strategic management is, that's the linking knowledge with action for impact. Okay. How do you actually link those two things? Um, civic engagement, our students, I think you may find this too, our students tend to be extremely engaged. They want to change the world, just like Andrew said. That is their motivation. So they bring this to us. Personal development. In some ways, this curriculum is like liberal arts meets agricultural and environmental sciences. Okay. Now, Arizona State University, up the road, across the hill, there's somebody there named Arnim Wyke, who's done a lot of work and published on what, what are the competencies that are needed for research and problem solving and sustainability? So Arnim, like our colleague Bill Clark, is doing this in a context of not food and agriculture, but anything you might name. And it's interesting, if we were to unpack these things, the list of competencies actually maps very closely to what our independent process at Davis produced in food and agriculture. I was talking with the dean of our graduate school of management a couple weeks ago. They've done a similar competency-based kind of approach to graduate management education. Lo and behold, a lot of these things are on there too. So one of the things that gives me some optimism about some kind of a universal pedagogy for sustainability is that these different experiments and experiences in pedagogy seem to be generating similar lists of key competencies. We're nowhere near the grand universal synthesis, but I guess I'd like to invite you guys to have a go too, see what you come up with, stay in touch on this, because this is really heavy lifting. It's, it's not easy stuff to do. If you just think about reward structures within academia, I need say no more. Okay. I'm not gonna say too much about our you know, what I think of is in terms of engagement and communication that link science with society, science with farmers. Gail has got a very nice talk later that addresses many of these things. But just wanted to say, you know, in contrast to 100 years ago when Cooperative Extension was founded with the Hatch Act, we recognize much more diversity. I used to say things have become more diverse. I think a lot of diversity was there. We just didn't pay attention to it. So well, we've got to be connecting with groups of people who actually don't think of the University of California as their university, even though they're California taxpayers. So that's about this reconstruction of legitimacy. And the other thing, it was a strategic decision we made. The, uh, our initial portfolio of activities was, was, was kind of organized around the environment or around food or around education, and we still have that thematic structure, but we're increasingly moving toward more sort of cross, massively cross-cutting things. We didn't, we could have done all cross-cutting all the time from the beginning, and right or wrong, we made the decision, we wanted to package things in a way that people could initially understand them a little bit more clearly, Just because there is a pitfall of sustainability about being, about everything all at once. So just kind of a pragmatic, <coughs> programmatic packaging. Um, so here's two of the current cross-cutting initiatives. One is about uh, pesticide exposure for farm workers and recalibrating for public policy. Gail's been a heroic leader in this. Um, getting people to actually participate in such a study is, is a tricky thing. Um, and then at the kind of a different scale, our first kind of, it's not really international, it's sort of global and theoretical, is 
what does sustainability really mean? We had a gift from Mars. We now have some money from Kraft Foods about, and I don't think I'm betraying it. I mean, the deal is that this is all transparent, not in the open. Basically, what they're saying is, what would be the empirical basis for a comprehensive, credible claim of sustainable sourcing? And particularly with Mars, it's very interesting. They're as interested in the social as the environmental. There's a very pragmatic reason for why they, they have that balance, but it also makes it interesting. And just, I think, two more slides and I'll stop. So getting back to research, um, which has actually surprised me. The building the collaborative research agenda, I thought was going to be the easiest thing to do. And it's actually been a harder thing to do. And again, it's like the dilemma at the national level. Everybody is busy. My colleagues at Davis have no shortage of funds to do research. They'll say differently, but they've got plenty of opportunities to fund their discipline-based research, and a lot of the incentives reinforce that. So what's, what's our proposition that would cause people to, to collaborate with us on an AFRI grant that's multidisciplinary rather than for them to write an AFRI grant proposal which supports their lab? I mean, we're asking them to make a very difficult choice. Um, and it's tended to be uh, what those of you who know sort of uh, integrated assessment practice like IPCC, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, it's tended to be those broader kind of assessment activities that fit our mission because they're really about framing questions that are relevant for policymakers and farmers. And that's something that people don't do on their own in their lab. So that's a niche partly because of my own history and what I used to do. But we've kind of, uh, I'd say, stumbled into that as a, as a value add for an integrative institute like this. Um, Gary very kindly mentioned the Russell Ranch Sustainable Agriculture Facility. This, it's a 285 acres. As far as we know, the only irrigated long-term research project for Mediterranean agriculture anywhere. Um, that big checkerboard is a data generator. Okay. And it's, supposed to, it's in year 20, it's supposed to run for 100 years. We recently reframed it. You obviously don't do the same thing for 100 years. But in fact, the, the original framing was around biogeochemical flows uh, and cycles. So water, nitrogen, phosphorus, things like that. So it, it, the tweaking, so the three dimensions that we emphasize now are land and soil, water, and <coughs> energy, and climate. Um, and But this on assessment, I, yeah, I did want to just mention that about the Russell Ranch, but it, we've, we took basically the IPCC and Millennium Ecosystem Assessment methods and downscaled them to look at the nitrogen cycle in California. You would think, who, who could get riled up about a study of the nitrogen cycle in California? The dean was getting letters, it's in the paper, um, and I'll tell you a bit why. So here's the kind of questions that came out. We did hundreds of events with many, many people around the state. So there was the question of what are the big sources of nitrogen pollution? Um, I, no points for guessing, actually. Um, I mean, agriculture, both cropping and dairy are, are the bulk of it. Um, what practices, what can you do about it, and what are the policy challenges? Turns out there are shelves and shelves of practices. Why do they sit there? Because all of these things involve either costs, more knowledge that we're not supplying, more management and attention, or all of the above. Okay. So we start out with this, what is the nitrogen problem in California agriculture? Is it costs, so wasting fertilizer? Is it air pollution? Is it surface? Is it groundwater? Is it public health? Is it climate change forcing? The Packard Foundation funded this with a the prior notion that it, the big issue was climate change forcing, it actually is groundwater pollution. Out of all the, nitrate, the nitrogen coming into the state, including combustion of fossil fuels, most of that is actually in the agriculture sector, and about between one, mole, uh, one atom of nitrogen in four and one atom of nitrogen in six each year ends up in our groundwater. So if you're running out of surface water, Looking at groundwater, that's, that's a big issue. But then, so 
So what's the problem? And farmers are saying, what's the nitrogen problem? I mean, we love nitrogen, right? That's what we need. So again, credibility, usefulness, legitimacy. The question was, is there enough solid scientific information? Well, yes and no. There are tons of studies about um, classical fertilizer response curves for crops. Okay, so that's about the 50% of nitrogen that actually ends up where we want it in the food we eat. The other 50% ends up in the environment, and there's actually very little comprehensive done on that. Um, what are the feasible options? I already talked about it. There's a bunch of feasible options. Um, but what we ran into and caused us to completely redesign the assessment was really a crisis of perception of legitimacy that the people who would have needed to use the innovations and participate in the policy dialogues didn't see this as a problem. They saw it as a threat to their business, and we got a lot of pushback. So I just want to conclude with, oh, this is, I guess this is the, um, <laughs> this is the PDF version. So after the disappointment with Copenhagen, I wrote this op-ed piece, and I put it in the Sacramento Bee, and I put it on the Huff Post. It was very interesting. In Huffington Post, the comments were, oh, this is all very well and good. Read my, buy my book, which is really about this. So that, that was very uh, uh, different. In the, in the Sacramento Bee, this is one of the comments. The Sacramento Bee comment, and I'm not making this up. This is a real comment. And on their website, they have the feature that the people who make comments can also vote on their favorite comment. And this was the favorite comment. So can the folks at Pima see that? Okay, so I won't read it out. But this was whoever, I don't know who After Hours is, but this, I've used this so many times. It was a great gift to me. Because for me, this captures this whole issue of legitimacy, right? So I'm on the take. I, I, have, a, I have a conflict of interest myself. And I'm manipulating this. And it's just a big com conspiracy to essentially defraud the public. So. This is the last slide. On this legitimacy thing, well, what do you do about it? Expect it if you're working on big stuff. So again, it's back to transparency. We spend a lot of time on uncertainty. What I'm going to talk about in Fresno next week about climate is, is actually how do, how do I know, it's, as a person who's not a climate scientist, how do I decide what to believe? And so a lot of it is about what's the, what's the uncertainty in the evidence? And fortunately, integrated assessment has given us a lot of tools for that. Um, we actively embrace the people. If I, could, if I knew who After Hours was, I'd invite that person out for coffee. Okay. We've, learned, we've got to go. And you can't get 100%, but you've got to be reaching for that group. Um, and we also changed our activities. I think Packard expected us to create a lot of cell phone apps about field level nitrogen use efficiency. We didn't do that because nobody would have used them because they didn't perceive the problem. So what we did was we actually shifted into another thing we got from international assessment practice was participatory scenarios. So we got a bunch of people, some who saw it our way, many who did not, to actually participate in a multi-day workshop with us about how are we going to be managing nitrogen in this state 20 years out. Um, and we do a lot of public outreach. And a lot of that is as much listening as it is talking, which I violated that rule fundamentally. I've just done all the talking, but um, I should stop. We're going to have a panel at this point, too. But I don't, how did you want to manage this stuff? Thank you, Tom. I think before we have our, our panel response, we definitely want time for questions and answers. So uh, let's take about 10 minutes. You all can have a chance to ask questions while, uh, with Tom. And then uh, we do have a panel that's going to respond. But you can take it, uh, I would say, well, some, well, OK, let's do this. Since people are already standing up. And, oh, no, I see the people are standing up. The people are part of the panel. That's different. But um, let, let's do a 10-minute sort of um, Question and answer. We'll take a short break and then we'll come back and do the panel. Okay. So, and and all any questions are perfectly welcome. I'll do my best. I don't, I don't promise I have all the answers. 
And do the Pima College folks have a chance to submit? They can, and, and if, they, if Pima College types in a, uh, a question, then Ray will bring the question up to you. Okay. I guess I put everybody to sleep. So your, your students are connected okay? So, a couple of them were having troubles. That's, I was sitting here answering emails. Okay. I would be sorry, and it's going to be posted online later. Okay. But most of them are in. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. And I'll be here all day. If, yeah, sure. oh, I have a question about the co-creation of knowledge or the co-creation of solutions. Um, common that you made in I was trying to think about, um, I think this is what was in your model, but maybe not, um, that there's knowledge systems out there in the world that are legitimate and have all kinds of power that are not at the university. And I'm because I'm interested in the community engagement part more than the other parts, mm -hmm. I feel like it has some legitimacy mm -hmm. there. How do you actually, besides having kind of forums, how do you get to that knowledge base that could inform actually university practices. Yeah. Not. So, um, so the question, and maybe I'll, I'll paraphrase the question because it's, better. no, <laughs> well, it's, it's basically, uh, what I hear is, is how do we actually opera, operationalize in a university this notion of co-creation? And I, I think part of what we do, there, there are different, I think there are actually different co-creation functions. So in my job, what I worry about a lot is, are we asking the right questions? Um, and so there are a lot of different ways that, it basically participatory techniques for what I would call co-framing of the agenda, okay? And, and the institute sets up, is set up, we invest in efforts to be connected, not just with the kind of thought leaders on the advisory board, but also with communities around the state to help to to bring those insights into our agenda. And our agenda is ultimately what we can do is framed by funding, but we don't drop things off of that research agenda or that educational agenda just because they're not funded at the moment. We keep them up there. So we, we have kind of one way we've tried to um, kind of balance this problem of having a comprehensive systems view with you can't do everything all at once is we put the view out there, but we say, right now we've got the resources to be working on these parts, but they're related to these other parts. Okay. So I think a big part is that co-framing. Then there's the co-creation of knowledge, but I think that's actually closely related to the co-creation of solutions. I mean, we, there are some separate knowledge things. This nitrogen assessment was very much about framing, well, what, what really is the policy question? And as we found out, the, where we started was completely wrong. And nobody had actually ever added the nitrogen up in that way. But, so it also means we have to be working across multiple boundaries. So there's the internal boundary across disciplines. I have no power over my colleagues to, I can't say you folks are now a team that has to work on this. It's about getting people excited about having kinds of impact and doing kinds of work that they couldn't do themselves, by themselves. And they don't have to be, we don't have to have everybody all the time. One of the patterns is people kind of opt in and out of different activities as, it, as it's useful for them. But the, the other part, which is part of the, again, I think an argument for having some kind of an institutional presence is there, every boundary you want to span requires investment in communication, translation, sometimes mediation. So we've got well-established channels with farmers and ranchers, but we've got to have channels with the environmental community, with social justice community, with policy makers at various levels. Strategic uh, decisions we've made is that we're focused on Sacramento to local. We're not striving to do that much in terms of national policy. Now, some of that is just California chauvinism. You know, we'll, we'll just do it and the rest of the country can catch up if they want to. But it's also, it's part of our assessment of what the, what the best opportunities are. Does that speak to your question at all? Okay. Oh, and one thing I would say, I think we've all done this as academics in proposals. 
We've consulted with all the stakeholders. That graphic I put up is part of saying, anytime you read that, question it. The key thing is knowing strategically what are the groups you've got to be interacting with for this particular thing. I saw another hand. Yes? There's, um, there's a growing uh, local food and part of that's going to ultimately involve uh, both uh, disseminating information that uh, exists and collecting information that's being evolved in the, in the community. Um, how are you able to work with uh, a large number of stakeholders, not a few hundred growers or something like that, but tens of thousands? So, so that it's 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 a I'll, I'll just rephrase it for this microphone too but it's it's the question of how, how do we actually scale up or out our collaboration so that they actually add up to something significant and I think what we're talking about is transformational right um, great question um, Gail's going to be talking about some specific cases right but we're still we're still struggling with the notion of what does it mean to have a statewide extension program in sustainable agriculture and food systems? I don't think we've quite nailed that yet. It does mean that we've got to go beyond the individual. F I can't have a personal relationship with all 39 million people in California. <laughs> well, that, okay, so Diana just said, well, we could do it on Facebook. <laughs> So we've actually, one of my board members is from Silicon Valley, and in, in Silicon Valley they have something they call solution centers. And that's how they accelerate the innovation process in some things. And those have at least three key elements. One is virtual network presence. The other, so Diana's got a third of it. The other is actually a network of human connections. So key connections. And the third part is actually a physical, tangible place. So Diana, I think you'll like this too because it's place-based. You gotta have a place where people can kick the tires and actually physically experience something. So we've, we're starting to, plan, uh, to prototype this solution centers model for agricultural innovation as, I guess it is partly the answer to your question of how do we have these three kinds of information flows all accelerating in innovation and be articulated. But you know, I'm just waving my hands and we just launched this thing a few months ago. So it's, the concept remains to be proven. But we know we can't have the white pickup model where we drive out to everybody. We're probably, yeah. yeah. Okay, why don't we, um, with the panels are gonna come up, but if people do want to stand up and stretch and take five minutes, I know what happens when you tell a room to go. Let's say four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I went over to you. I know. Oh, was it good? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think what happens is we got the PDF one rather than the phone. And I don't know if it's going to be a good So, yeah, I'm going to be more than a good one. Well, he's such a great ally. Um, he totally thinks this. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I mean, I was being down there for when I said he basically gave my talk. Uh, yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. Hey. Uh,
Come back in from the lobby, we'd appreciate it. sit down. I just want to give a, a few, uh, uh, not ground rules, but a little bit about the structure of this. Um, uh, two things. Uh, Rafael and I will facilitate moving mics to you all. And we're, we're interested in, in dialogue with the panelists. We have uh, uh, many uh, fine panelists and, and uh, Tom's going to uh, join us so that you can uh, also ask you more questions. I'm going to turn this over uh, to Rafael in a moment to introduce the panelists. 
but I want to say two things. In the purposes of interactions, we really want, I don't want to say sound bites or elevator talks, but we really don't uh, want to focus on long commentaries, either from participants or panelists, but sort of, um, here's some sources, here's some priorities, sort of bullet point things that we can capture for our note taking and build into a larger plan. So again, let's really facilitate interaction rather than uh, uh, longer commentaries. Uh, second of all, this is about um, this whole thing of um, how we have um, U of A position itself in that helping uh, create impact across the entire food system, not just agriculture. And food system and food shed means that we're going from local to international. Uh, only 2% of our food comes from local sources. We want to increase that, but we can't ignore the fact that we're in a great opportunity uh, because we're so close to the border that we see the effects of an international food system as well. So we welcome comments across that entire gradient, not just one or the other. Um, with that um, introduction, um, Ravel, do you want to add some comments? Thank you everyone for coming here. I think I corresponded via email with most of you, but it's nice to put some names to faces, and I'm really grateful that you're here today. I think we're going to try to make a big difference, and that involves not just the university, but the community. So please do your best to, I like action, and I like things to, be, to happen, to, to take effect. So I'm going to introduce our panelists here. We've tried to put together a panel that represents the broad range of people that we think are critical in actually making things happen at the University of Arizona and in the greater Tucson community. So our first one, Jody Lee Duke, is with Pima Community College. We, we can't just stay centered at the University of Arizona. We need to look at all of the means of higher education in the Tucson community. Thank you, Jody Lee. Diana Liverman. She's with the Institute of the Environment and a very wonderful, powerful geographer as well as climate social scientist. She is someone that actually makes things happen and inspires many others to do so also. Thank you very much, Diana, for joining us. Doug Tarrant, College of Public Health. He was instrumental in getting the grant that actually makes this all come together. And we wouldn't be here without Doug. Thank you. Diane Austin is from BARA, the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology. And when we're thinking about food systems, again, it isn't just the actual means of producing food, but all of the social implications that go along with the people involved in food, food systems, the border. Diana, I think Diane covers a little bit of all of it. Thanks for joining us. Jordan Miller is a graduate student with the College of Public Health. She's working a lot with nutrition as well as the social aspects, again, of nutrition and food systems. And we're, this isn't about faculty only, it's not about the higher ups in the university, it's not about just the community members, there are also students here and a lot of the reason we're doing this is to facilitate that movement of students into action. And uh, Jordan's been joining us quite a bit so far in this food systems group and so she's going to kind of take that perspective on the panel. And then Moses Thompson. We visited Monzo Elementary School yesterday with both Tom and Gail, and it was remarkable. If you have not been, and uh, Moses probably doesn't want to see all of you. What? <laughs> I'm sorry, we're going to do this. It's overrun the students yeah. there. But it's phenomenal. You just walk in, and he has everything from aquaponics, hydroponics, rainwater collection systems. They really have a remarkable thing, and I think Moses is responsible for most of it. So if you want to see things happening, in the community, affecting over 300 low-income youth in a single neighborhood school. It's really powerful. Please do go. And then we have Tom. And I think we're all, we've all been inspired by Tom. So I'm going to step away and allow you to actually direct some questions. If you don't have specific questions, I think we're set with them from the audience. Statements. Hey, press mail. Yes. Can I think everybody some prepared first? some statements. Oh, everyone's prepared some statements. <laughs> Thank you. We'll do it that way. So we'll start with the panelists. Yeah, but I think, again, we're, we're aiming for the interaction. So yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, one for the panel, one for the audience. We don't and have two, to. And I'll pick no, one okay. and move it around. One one it's different. always good to have some statements. People were re response to yes. a response, right? I think that is great. I perfect. Sure. Thanks. I'm glad you're starting. And actually, you should start then. <laughs> um, <laughs> you have some. Here, I'm going to pass it to you, and you can hand it to people in the audience. Or yeah. Let's do one for the table. One oh, God. great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's what happens when you speak up. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, 
Uh, is this being picked up yeah. by the thing? Okay. Um, I didn't necessarily want to say anything, but <laughs> we, got, we got an email uh, with Tom's presentation in advance saying, please, please prepare a response. So um, I tried to prepare a response. And first of all, I, I just want to say how wonderful it is to have Tom and Gail here. Uh, as you could tell from his comments, uh, Tom and I know each other mainly because we've uh, been editing the annual reviews um, of environment and resources together for a number of years, which involves getting together once a year and arguing fiercely about the cutting edge um, questions in the field. And uh, Tom's, he doesn't know this, but I think he is my very favorite member of the editorial board. So. Yeah. Um, so I'll just say a couple of things, and they're really questions um, partly to um, Tom and Gail. You, you presented what's happening at Davis as um, bringing in a large number of stakeholders and working across the university, but for me at the University of Arizona, I still think um, we have work to do bringing together the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences and the rest of the university around these issues. And there's a lot of people from our College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here, but I work, because I run a university-wide um, institute, I work with all the deans. And I know that when you're working in the area of environment or sustainability, um, some of the deans at U of A, much as they support interdisciplinarity, they can get a little bit nervous when you use the terms green or sustainable or environment because they're dealing with some very conservative stakeholders within the state. Um, and so one of the um, questions I wanted to ask for more advice on is um, how we reach out um, to the deans. Because if um, Andrew, for example, is going to give support to um, the initiative or to the sort of food systems initiative we've got here, we've got to make sure that all the deans are on board and think of it, and that's just the practical politics of the university. So I'm really interested in how you negotiate that a little bit more at Davis because um, it, you did talk about some of the things about how you have included agribusiness and everybody can be part of it, but how do we, how do we make that work um, here? Um, and the second thing um, I wanted to uh, just raise, and Gary, you um, spoke to this a little bit, is a lot of what you presented, Tom, was US focused. Um, but I'm in an argument right now with, um, as part of the National Climate Assessment, which is being released next week, um, which U of A has played a big role in. And um, within the National Climate Assessment, um, the agriculture chapter was mostly written by people from USDA. And um, there are two things. First of all, they haven't really taken a food systems approach. It's about the yields and um, not really about everything else in the food system. But the other thing is it's as if the US or Tucson is um, in isolation from the rest of the world. Now, if you're in California, maybe you can be a bit more isolationist because your economy and your agriculture is more diverse. But my question uh, really for us is how do we collect, connect the local to the global whilst we increase the amount of food grown locally um, and we can make links with it. Mexico, part of the issue that I um, hear is that what matters to most people is price, whether you're a farmer or a consumer. And so much of what places food security in Tucson or Arizona at risk are fluctuations in global prices that are driven by not just climate, but speculation and growing demand in Asia. And so I'm interested in that uh, because if we really want Tucson to be food secure, we have to deal with the million people, not the few people from the farmers markets. And then the final thing um, I wanted to uh, comment on is, or ask um, the Davis team about, is the climate change issue and um, how your group is getting into conversations about the drought in California, which many people are fingerprinting as uh, global warming, and in particular, I think that if we're going to get um, support for food systems research um, at U of A 
beyond sort of local support, we need to be stepping up to take on some of the big food systems questions that are coming up in the assessments. And I was just recent, just last week at a meeting where we were trying to identify all the gaps in the latest climate assessment. And there were several. One is not taking a food systems approach to climate. And I think U of A is really well prepared because we are so great on climate change here with just so many people and with the food systems group perhaps we could do more to get big funding for the whole group through that and the second thing is the question of emissions and how we deal with the debate now about the role that livestock and meat is playing in climate change because that's a raging debate is it 15 percent of emissions or is it 50 percent of emissions and in IPCC they don't do a life cycle analysis of the food system. And then the, just the final comment is because I represent the group that funded this, the UA Water Environment and Energy Solutions, um, I wanted to give, I warned uh, Doug that I wanted to give the heads up that in fact WEES, which Doug seeds this sort of activity within the university, we've been asked to change our strategy as a result of the strategic plan. So going forward, we're going to be doing much more in terms of funding people to write specific proposals or to provide match for proposals. It's not going to, um, so it's all about increasing faculty productivity, which is, um, I don't necessarily fully support that shift, but to the extent this group can um, get organized, including people from the community, to think about proposals to major foundations or to federal agencies, um, and can work with WEEZ to have us help you be more successful around specific things, then that would be um, easier for us to support given our current um, uh, mandate. So thank you. Thank you, Diane. I want to mention that we're, the way we want to frame this is using uh, Tom's as a point of departure for what we should be doing. So the kind of questions that you raised are good. We really want to have brief statements that bring us back to action items, as Rafael said. Uh, uh, Doug, do, uh, do you want to uh, go next? Yeah, actually, I'm just going to focus on, on one piece of that of this, is, and that's the student engagement that UC Davis has. Uh, one of my roles at the College of Public Health, some, some of you know, but I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, and that's really the curriculum working with students. We have a thousand undergraduate students in public health that all need internships. Now, just think about that, a thousand students in Tucson that are going to need internships pretty soon. The question for me is, how can we get them involved in issues like food systems uh, related to public health? And we have students here, what are the types of projects that get students uh, excited? And what are the types of projects people in the community want students to come in and help with? And how can we integrate that into our curriculum? And then we can also move forward, not just in public health, but as we start thinking about a food systems curriculum at this campus, how, what, how do we expand that with the community more? And uh, so actually, I'm responding, but I'm actually putting a question out to the audience too at the same time. Because I think it's really important to hear from everyone in the audience about, you know, this is what we would like uh, students to be doing in our community to help us meet these objectives. Great. We miss Jody. Why don't we uh, uh, pick her up? Because she's in fact doing a lot of this engagement of students at Pima College. So thank you, Jody Lee. Thank you. Um, so I teach environmental studies and human nutrition at the little teeny tiny campus on the southwest side of Tucson. And the majority of my students, who are some of whom are listening, uh, are either Hispanic or Native American or both. And in working with, with these folks, I found that many of them have lost the heritage that when I first started teaching, everyone's Nana still, t still gardened. That is less and less so today. And so having the students garden has been an integral part the last few years. It took us 10 years to get the garden. But now for the last four years, we've had the garden and students are rediscovering the joy of picking something like a pea and eating it, standing there in the garden and going, wow, this tastes amazing. This doesn't taste like the stuff we eat at home. And some of that has been really exciting we are also we're an 
right in the middle of one of the food deserts in Tucson. So the other thing that we have done is brought the Market on the Move program to our campus. And there are months when we distribute up to 700, 750 families worth of food supplies through this Market on the Move program. And I'm not going to go into it. Many of you probably know about the program. Pima College now has Market on the Move at three of its six campuses. I'm thrilled to say. And I'm hoping that we can connect with some of the folks in this group to have, we'd love to have some of your folks come out and do internships at Pima College. Yes. <laughs> and I'm sure there are lots of other great connections we can make. That would be super. Thank you, Gary, for Thank inviting you. me. Diane? Hi, I'm Diane Austin, and first I want to thank the organizers for putting this together and our guests from UC Davis, but especially all of you. This is, a, as I was looking around the room when I came in, it's a fascinating opportunity to be in a space where we have our colleagues here, we have our students and former students here, and we have many of the experts and our community leaders here. And those are leaders from small and large organizations, a number of you who we've been partners with over the years, and I want to say a special thanks to you all and acknowledge the role, the critical role that you all play in mentoring our students, in mentoring us, in coming up with the ideas that we move forward with. And I think oftentimes we get rolling on the university side and we forget that there's a lot of expertise and a lot of knowledge right here in the community. And I think that leads me, we're having a little conversation at the break, to a point that I think as we think about what partnerships work, how do we develop those kind of partnerships, both across campus but also with the communities that we work in, that bring together some of those critical competencies and skills. And a few of the things that were mentioned to me over the break were things like humility, parity, things that are not necessarily the competencies are upon which folks who have advanced through higher education have been rewarded for because we have a different reward system. And I think that's it's critically important that we recognize that up front and think about how do we make room for lots of voices and lots of different perspectives here. So I challenge all of us to think through that today and ongoing as we continue. And again, just Thanks for the opportunity. I think there's a lot of potential here. Hooray for you, Diane. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Jordan, you've been involved both as a student in community projects and on some of the imaginations of where we should move this. What's your perspective? Um, well, it seems like I'm, I'm in line with a lot of what everyone else is saying. I've been thinking a lot about um, some of the ideas that were generated from the workshops that were held leading up to this conference. Um, about ways that the university can really partner with the community even more to generate more research to address the real world problems that um, that people are working with every day. Um, and I'm also thinking about, from a student perspective, about service learning opportunities and ways to really make those opportunities meaningful for students, but also meaningful for the community partners as well. I mean, I think as a student, one of the most rewarding things is to feel like you're really meeting a need when you go out into the community and you invest your time and your energy. And as much as we want to learn and we want to apply the skills and the information we've been learning, we really also want to, to help and make a difference. Um, so I was thinking when I was looking at the Solution Center that, that UC Davis um, has set up, that there's an opportunity there um, to use a similar model to establish Service learning opportunities um, here as well. Great, Moses. Uh, you're on the ground level that interact with a lot of different university people too. So you are exactly the kind of person that Diane <laughs> is suggesting we seek guidance from and how to structure these relationships. And what's your experience with that? Yeah. So um, I started the Ecology and Sustainability program um, at Monzo eight years ago, and so for the for the past. For the past eight years, the, the scope of the work that I've been doing is very small. Um, 300 students in Barrio Hollywood and looking at how we transform um, the school campus to, to meet the needs of our students emotionally, socially, academically, and health and wellness as well. And so as I come here and I start looking at things 
on, on a broad scale, um, my position also is shifting. And um, I'm not only looking at Monzo, but looking to work within the Tucson Unified School District to, um, to grow programs and, and replicate some of the things that, that we found success with at Monzo. And um, as I listened to, to Tom speak today, um, where Tom embraces the, the turmoil and messiness of bringing stakeholders with diverse perspectives from the, to the table, um, that's, I'm about, I'm ready to go headlong into that, working with um, people from the Tucson Unified School District from food services that are um, hyper-focused on um, food safety and liability, um, you know, people from um, facilities that, that are worried about um, the toll that school gardening programs might have on facilities, and um, it, it's bound to be a messy process, and so um, I feel like I'm here to learn, and I've, I've already been inspired, and so, you know, as we move forward, it'll be interesting in the next couple of years to see how we take a, a program um, that grew very, from very grassroots and in isolation, and, and that was a very advantageous place to, to grow a program. But now as it, it moves towards something more institutional, um, there, there are a lot of challenges that, that we're about to, to come up against as we look to, to grow these programs. So. I, I just want to say that uh, affecting 300 students who uh, eat 1,000 meals a year is no small scale project. <laughs> and your impact is well beyond just the hours you put in with them because this is setting them up for life. So thank you for that work. Thank you. Um, Tom, you, you've uh, talked about the structure at Davis, you've seen a bit of here, you've had contact with a bunch of us before. In terms of the contrast, what strengths and, and advantages, weaknesses and gaps, you sort of do a comparative analysis because I know with your assessment back in Crown, you're pretty dang, dang good at that. Um, I mean, it's taken me seven years to learn the Davis system and I've been here, what, 24 hours or so, so I kind of hesitate. Um, and, and I just want to say, I mean, I feel an urgency about kind of getting the conversation out to the community members, and Moses, Jordan, Diane, and Doug all raise things that I think is there for the conversation the whole day. But one, one, one generalization I would venture to make is, Diane raised the question, basically, how do you get the deans on your side? And, so the, the Davis experience would suggest the way to do that, the vehicle to deans, and I would add faculty is students. And uh, I, I would be willing to bet that there is a, a, a core of activist students in any college you could pick who are very motivated by food issues. And that's actually our historic opportunity at this moment. We couldn't have done this 25 years ago. So that's, that's what I would do. But you, the other thing I would say is you've got to be in it for the long haul, right? It's taken, it hasn't been weeks or months. It's been years, and I don't want to discourage anybody, but it, the time scale is more like decadal. Um, but that's what it takes to transform institutions. But, but I, would go, I would go for students, and I would, would try to create every possible opportunity for students to demonstrate the power of this idealism combined with pragmatism producing solutions. And, you know, I met your provost, very impressed with him. He's a great ally. But even, even if not everybody is as amazing as Andrew is, it's hard for administrators to resist that tide of enthusiasm and results. So that would be my main. Um, I did want to say just something about what Jody said, because one of the things I've slowly understood is, is this is both the opportunity and the challenge about cultural heritage, lost heritage, continuation of heritage, uh, reproduction and transformation of heritage. And I, I think this is a challenge for all of us, but the, the way that the deep history of the food system in North America has led to really terrible aspects of our history, genocide, slavery, domination of various kinds, 
I haven't had the guts to say this publicly in California, but I'll say it here. Yeah, I was very, and we'll see how it goes, and then maybe I'll try it out in California. I was very impressed with the truth and reconciliation process in South Africa. And I'm wondering if we, if we don't need something like that around the food system in the United States. And, but that causes people like me to have to kind of take a deep breath, because I want results. And actually, when you hook, just when you commit to something like that, you have to create the space for people to tell their own stories. And that requires, again, a bit of time. Excellent. I think I'll stop with that. Yeah, so we're going to go back and forth. Rafael's going to bring that mic to this side of the room, and whenever there's a response, if it's on that side, I'll bring this mic up. If one of you oh, care yes. to answer, so start it off. <laughs> Hi, it's so. Um, so my name is Marlena Hanlon, and uh, actually sure. my comment ties off of yours uh, in a perfect segue because um, I know for me a tension point in this conference and others like it over the years, and I think that's point uh, question in fact illustrates that um, the fact that that question even needs to be asked speaks and reveals to a historic dysfunctional relationship that the university has had with the community. And um, I feel like that, that needs to be addressed politically um, in this process. And so you know, there's a reconciliation process that needs to take place. And I know that I recently conducted research that examined two disparate neighborhoods in Tucson and looking at how the infrastructure, services, accessibility was reflected in their ethos around uh, engagement and perspective. And so one of the things I would like to see a student army come out for <laughs> is to do some uh, terrain, I guess some terraform, that if we turned every right of way in poor neighborhoods into an urban food forest, we would cross cut across all disciplines. Uh, it's a public health issue, it's a water and climate issue, it's an opportunity to educate um, young people not only in ecology but also in leadership opportunities and community development. And it's so simple and low cost, it's mostly manual labor. Um, and I don't understand why this hasn't been used on every street corner in every neighborhood in Tucson. That's great. That's great. Let's have a quick response yeah. and then uh, Rafael will move the mic around. I heard the mayor speak last week at, at my campus. Um, and one of the questions that he was asked was, are you interested, is the city moving towards doing some of that open agriculture for everyone and his response was yes it's in the works uh, just um, on two comments one about the question to get input from the community i think at least on this campus and both almost all the colleges i know about we become very focused on what we call community-based participatory research and really it wasn't due to a lack of what has happened in the past which definitely has occurred but also the realization that community-based participatory approaches actually get better solutions. So it's not just that we are trying to say how to do it, but we know now that process involved is actually better. And of course, we shouldn't just always be top down too. And in regards to your second comment on um, to edible forests, edible foods around campus or around the city, all I can remember is when I was a student here in 71, 72, in those years, um, I remember going down to probably about 9th Street. And 9th Street was lined with pomegranate trees. And I was poor, I was a student, I used those pomegranates to help eat. During, I just pulled them off the tree. So I know it's possible to do. And I agree with you, but we have to have good examples of it working. And we had to have these experimental places where we can actually show that it's not going to be an issue. It's going to actually help a neighborhood. So we need to start practicing those, those, um, you know, situations that you described. If we have to find a few locations to do it, monitor it. And this is being the scientist, and, and show that these are real um, sustainable methods to create livable and edible um, forests. In the interest of uh, keeping it moving, yeah. I'm just going to have two responses yeah. from the panel each question. <laughs> so, I'm over here. 
So maybe we should switch side to side. <laughs> I'll just segue from that. I'd like to make an argument for working with neighborhood associations here in Tucson. Many of us are really well organized, and without really any support or recognition from the university, we have installed water harvesting basins that capture stormwater runoff from the university. We've gotten grants to do that. We've planted trees all on our own, and we could really do this. We could really do this vision if we had some kind of funding and technical support from the university, but up until now we've been pretty much ignored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Response from the yeah. Dan, you have um, I'm going to respond to both. Mm -hmm. um, it's really um, thinking about the people who um, will help this happen, and um, if we want to have 35,000 students helping people in the community, um, I think um, I think about the workload of people like Moses as we throw more and more students at him, or of the people who run, who the faculty who step up to do the internship programs like Diane and Sally, because they're often a lot more work than just walking into the lecture theater and delivering a lecture. And so, and I worry sometimes when we just send people out into the community is that are we putting a big burden on someone in the community because they've got to manage these undergraduates. And so I think one of the things um, we need to think about when we expand student engagement is who has the time and can they do it thoughtfully so that the students get a great experience, they don't like mess up, and so that we can find the faculty to to manage that and most people have job descriptions which you know everybody has a job description <laughs> whether they're a homemaker or a faculty member and how do we actually find the time to manage that student engagement that's what I worry a lot about and I'd be interested if people have ideas about how we could do that do we need to add in the university a whole new cohort of people who help manage internships in a thoughtful way um, there is a grant from the Green Fund that the Institute of the Environment has just got, which is to write a green engagement guide. And this group might be really ideal because we thought about putting principles for engagement, which are about thoughtful engagement with the community and listening and all of that sort of thing. So um, I'll invite people to be part of that process. <laughs> and I should just say that those issues came before the president and the provost. If we're talking about 100% engagement. Barbara Adish Kishida has suggested some ways that we contractualize and give ground rules that both shares a burden of management on that. Um, question here. My name is Madeline Kaiser. I teach um, juvenile detention in the jail, and also I'm part of like reentry coalition discussions and others on poverty in our community. There's a lot of coalitions. So I just want to throw out. I think that. In, this, in these meetings on how do we work with the 30% you know, or more dropping out of school and create meaningful employment, also mental health issues that are poorly, there's very little of this. So I think that there's also a lot of allies among these coalitions that aren't in these kind of conversations that would really appreciate the chance to become part of the Healthy Food Network, also the you know, Healthy Water Network. So just that cross-pollinating between coalitions, I think, would go a long way. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. We work with the dropout prevention at um, Catalina Magnet, um, um, not just with refugees, as people might think we discussed the refugee network only works with refugees, but there's more food going to waste in the city that, than I can adequately get out to refugee families, bombarding them with fresh fruits and vegetables naturally grown and I think before we talk about urban developing urban forests we have to bring the elephant out of the box we feed the elephants at the zoo too with pumpkins but bring the elephant out of the box of how much food waste there is and how do we approach that and there's Diane I there's 10 masters degrees that I, that I think that could be um, funneled into this this particular issue but what we hear when we're all excited about lo growing the local food system is more about how do we grow more and how do we teach people to grow whereas we have many many 
um, trees that are not being utilized with our water resources going into those households, but um, the fruit not being um, used. And when and we and it's I think it's a language issue when we say agriculture, no one thinks gleaning. I just went through the UA food system or the. Yeah, the net network notes, there's no gleaning, there's no reference to it, although we participated in um, many of those discussions. So how do we speak louder? How do we educate and raise awareness? And I think through the UA Green Fund, we have a, had an opportunity to reach students this year, Ishkashito, working with the UA Linking Edible Arizona Forest, um, but back to um, the the, the bit about mentoring and supervising huge amounts of our time is used to do that yet we have no financial backing to that and there's an open document on my computer looking at a grant to be paid for exactly what we're doing we're we're, we're spearheading this social change in cultural compensation because we work with refugees from Africa Asia and the Middle East but also um, looking at the food system, looking at food waste, and how do we, how do they become part of the solution? Um, so, responses. I would say, as a as a graduate student, we were talking about this recently in the College of Public Health and the supervision issue. And just to throw it out there, I have an idea that you could use master's level graduate students to help supervise the undergrads because that's one of the things we're all really looking for to be marketable when we graduate is supervisory experience. So, yeah, just to support what Jordan said, we, we're, our approach to extremely rapid growth is actually thinking about cascading mentoring across faculty, graduate students, undergraduates, high school students, and that's been one way we cope. But this is, you're, you're, many of these remarks are touching on things that I think it's good you're anticipating them now because these are the issues that metaphorically I wake up screaming at night about. So the, the two things, so I, the thing about success is the institute has about 30 staff. Those aren't all full-time people. But these things to do them right require some, some high-performance high skills. I worry a great deal, and Gail, I think, would back me up on this. Um, we, we, we're burning our people out because we're growing faster than we can accommodate. And that has, that has two implications. One for education is we're struggling to, to maintain the quality of the experiential learning process as the cohorts get bigger. So that, what your suggestion, Jordan, is one approach there. But the other thing that really scares me is that it's very easy for the University of California to show up with a community that hasn't received any attention and just by having a few conversations have huge expectations created. And that's, that's all fine, they're entitled to that, but then our capacity to deliver is really constrained. Yeah, Jim Riley recently retired from the U of A. One of the things that Tom said I agree with about getting these activist students involved, but one of the things we learned with our water harvesting on the U of A campus is you must have the faculty and the staff, particularly facilities management and the grounds people involved. The grounds people were saying to us, wait a minute, how would you like us to come to your classroom and tell you what to do? Because uh, that's how they saw our involvement and the publicity was for the students and it didn't get down to, they said, well, we're helping you with this. Why isn't there something in the Wildcat about us helping you? So you really need to have the whole campus, and whether it's at a elementary school or at a uh, other college of the community, you know, you, you brought up how many people need to be involved, and that's what you need to recognize them. Moses, do you have that issues with Monzo's stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, when we first started doing infrastructures on, on the campus, there really wasn't protocol set up for um, doing these large scale, these large scale projects, and so um, we did the best that we could. We 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 called out our blue stake. We talked to the the, the engineering department. We um, but we always left people out of the process, and it, it's problematic as you look to grow programs because 
once you've alienated your, your irrigation guys, you know, that, that's, a huge, that's a huge problem. And now I know that before I do any, any projects, in the ground projects, I call out the irrigation guys because they're, they're at every site. And um, yeah, you just, you have, to, you have to respect their work. Um, also something that I realized from the, from the time we start, started doing garden installations or rainwater harvesting installations is um, everybody with facilities has a list of schools that haven't done it right and have caused problems um, within the district and cost the district money. And so there's more at stake with the projects that we do than just having good outcomes for our one site. The, the implications are bigger. And so when you break ground, you really do have to have all of the stakeholders at the table and it has to be a meaningful experience for them and the outcomes for your project have to be exceptional so that so that everybody with blue collar services and facilities um, has your project is, is the, the example when other projects go forth, somebody else submits a proposal and instead of saying um, this campus across the, the district tried this three years ago and it was a mess and it was underfunded, they never finished it, we had to come in. Um, instead they have, they have the success to look at and say, you know what, I see some real potential with this project. Go see Moses over at Monzo and, and let him walk you through that project. And so I think as we do community engagement, it's, it's important to, to realize how much is at stake um, with doing good works in the, in the community and building relationships with with all of those stakeholders because that, that can either open doors or close doors for the people coming down the line to, to do similar projects. Great, we have about 10 minutes or a little bit less, so let's uh, uh, keep the exchange going, Diana. Oh, uh, I've got a couple of things that I wanted to mention, but first of all, I'm Diana Hadley and I'm one of the founding board members of Mission Garden, which is a living, edible, Museum of Agricultural History in the Tucson Basin, put up a mountain. I want to invite all of you to come and see Mission Garden. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's a great project. Um, I also wanted to mention um, two outreach, you know, co-creation outreach areas to go to that I think are really important. And one for the FFA and the 4-H, I think that that is like one of the best, those are two of the best agencies that you can go to to get kids involved in agriculture. And if they don't have parents who remember, I mean, these, these, these are people from, the agri from agricultural backgrounds. And if they don't have parents that still work in agriculture, maybe they've got their grandparents that they can go and interview. And it's a, it's a really great way to reform agriculture, and the, the 4-H, FFA has done some of that, but the 4-H clubs are still, you know, fattening steers for more marbling and creating unhealthy beef with corn, and it would really be great if the universities could become more involved with, with that type of agricultural extension and outreach. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was this program that was done by Bioneers in New Mexico. My late husband um, was the director of this. And one of, it's Greening New Mexico, and what they did was first an energy uh, scheme for reforming energy distribution in the state. And then they followed it up with agriculture. And one of the major outreaches that they did in the agricultural portion was to mayors of small rural communities. And that's a neglected sector of uh, the political spectrum. And they, the mayors were really happy in these small towns to get involved and get involved with um, universities and, and, and co-op. The other thing that I wanted to mention was that there is a student, in, in, she's a freshman in um, engineering. And she is really upset that the University of Arizona does not have a cafeteria where you can sit down and eat vegetables and meat it does. and potatoes and it does. eat normal <laughs> meal. You can only go in the food court to no. get something from uh, an international, um, you know, no, the basement has yeah, the local yeah. food. Yeah. And so that's something that I think that the U of A should say to look at in its outreach. 
Yeah. Um, we, we actually do have a facility within the student union that serves um, vegetarian sustainable local food. It's in the basement. A lot of the students don't um, discover it, but um, it is there. And the new, the new director of the student union is um, very committed to trying to work with the local community. We have a new director as of a few months ago, so I think it might be nice for the Food Systems Network maybe to meet with him. And while I'm at it, I'd like to uh, mention that we will also get a new director of Campus Sustainability um, beginning July 8th. And um, the history of that is that Andrew Comrie, a number of years ago, funded uh, Campus Office of Sustainability. The U of A students self-imposed a tuition fee increase to create a green fund for sustainability, which is supporting some of the initiatives that we all work on. And Ben Champion, who's coming to be the new director, um, is unbelievably committed to food systems work. He actually did his PhD on local food systems in Kansas. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He's been the director of sustainability at Kansas State and has done amazing things to reach out to the community. So maybe um, the food systems group should meet with him soon after he gets here because I think he'll uh, be a real leader on campus for us. So at my campus, we have the Center for Training and Development, which trains students to do um, all sorts of things in food service, from menu creation to cooking. And that group produces meals every day in our cafeteria at Desert Vista campus of Pima College. And they are using things right out of the garden that they grow. So we're going 100 yards with our food and producing a lot of things. And I also quickly want to just mention, a couple of you have talked about employability skills. There are some really nice programs that I've heard of recently in other cities that are taking students and teaching them the skills to make vertical gardens, to make pallet gardens, to, to do water systems and water harvesting systems and aeroponics and hydroponics, and so the students come out not only with a knowledge of the garden system, but also with some employability skills in how to design um, food systems for local use with families or with small communities. Thanks, we just have two more minutes over here. I just want to say something in defense of 4-H uh, because uh, if you think 4-H is still just fattening cows, you haven't been to Tucson Village Farm, which is the new face of 4-H. And I, I guarantee if you go over there, you'll get a whole different idea of what 4-H is all about. So please take the opportunity. Also, I just want to say that if you want to have um, some of your students come out and intern and get a real practical, real world example of what's going on in the community, don't forget about your extension offices because right. we have opportunities yeah. to take on students. Not a lot of them, just like Moses. <laughs> we don't want to be overwhelmed with managing people, but we do have the opportunities to work with folks like that. And lastly, the city has invited everyone here on May 13th to come to the Urban Agriculture Public Meeting to talk about issues in the city mm -hmm. and affect <laughs> how our urban agriculture is, is uh, handled. And do something. So you should all come out because I think you all have great opinions. So. <laughs> Let's pick up with uh, Robert quickly. I have a question around sort of the high overhead costs that you have at the university. And if we're interested in really <laughs> developing these partnerships, it's not really viable for community organizations to partner with you if the overhead costs are so high. So is there sort of a, an idea for how you can actually proceed? And I'm curious about how you guys do it at Davis. There you go. <laughs> Let's, have Let's give it to Tom. Maybe he's got the <laughs> At least we don't have Stanford 75% over there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the campus overhead rate is about 50%. Same as us. Um, we, we do a lot through philanthropy and gifts. And um, those, in, in our system, those, those bear a, um, a lower, that's a 6% cut. But I must say, I mean, I'm very torn on this because I have a 300-acre 
a hundred year experiment going, which is addressing fundamentals of soil, water, and climate. Um, the legislature is not supporting that. Um, how do we, we, there's a, we haven't solved the problem of funding science, education, and extension in the public interest. And that, I mean, that's, I'll just leave it with that. Oh, I'll make a, a quick comment and then keep passing it on. And this is a this is a hugely important question, and I think it gets to a, another area when we talk about sustainability, and that is alternative economic systems um, and things like barter. And you know what we're hearing is you know we ask you all to help mentor students if you're off campus, and we don't pay you to do that. So how do we create some system that says there are certain types of projects that have waivers on overhead for, for because of X, Y, or Z that's coming? We have some of that here at the university, and I, we always are in, exploring ways to get around that. Clearly, Tom hit right on it. As the budgets are shrinking in terms of state support, the pressure on faculty, directors, et cetera, to generate money to fill those gaps and to have not just student tuition be funding everything on the campus really are, are critical. And I think this is another one of those ongoing conversations that we have to have if we're really partnering here in the community. And we'll finish with Diana. Or Diana um, so um, I would add to Diane that if it's uh, funding from a donor or a foundation, the overhead, as long as they publicize that they only give 10% overhead, the university will accept that. If you're trying to do a partnership with someone on campus and you're having trouble, talk to some of us who negotiate this all the time. Um, so for example, if a donor gives less than $5,000 to the foundation, it's not taxed at the same rate, so you can do things that way. Um, I really think the university should think about giving honoraria to people in the community who um, engage. It's something we should talk to Andrew about if we're going to have this student engagement. We do that with a couple of programs where we just really want to keep people involved. They're modest honoraria, but I think that, you know, we get decent salaries. Um, we should pass some of that funding on to people in the community. And it's perfectly possible to do that. You can give an honoraria to a community mentor, and we should do that. And everyone write Andrew this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We should, yeah. we should okay. finish up this and uh, go into the next panel. But we'll keep the discussion going in other parts. Okay.